8, we're going to be part of our artificial intelligence class today, and this will be a longish kind of thing today. So lots of neat things. We're going to really cover some neat stuff in this one. So this is like one of my favorite things when we're talking about is we're talking about how do we use data to solve an actual problem. So we're going to take a look at the school district of Philadelphia as our opening kind of vignette was our, our entire process around this. And what's kind of neat is that they really wanted to do an optimization model to determine how best to structure class cohorts to minimize reshuffling of students within a school system. Now this is really kind of important. Once you've started with a group of students, you kind of want to end with that same group of students. But you know that people are going to come and go. You know, you're in a normal class now, you know that you'll have some students in the same class and in other classes you won't have those same students. So we want to make sure that when we're building those social connections among the students, that we really do minimize any kind of reshuffling or anything else that we need to do with those students. So what did Philadelphia do? Now, I thought this was neat. They did a predictive modeling of incoming student enrollment, and they used four different kinds of methods to solve the problem, right? So they used an ordinary least scores regression. They used a least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. They used an elastic net, and then they used a random forest. So out of, the, out of all this, out of the four predictors provided the most meaningful contribution to accurately predicting school grade by grade enrollment, they use 259 points in their data models to try to figure out which ones would work with the data. And they didn't just do one thing, they did four different kinds of models. And out of those, four of the 259 predictors stood out as the most important. Prior cohort size, in school suspensions, out of school suspensions and absences. So regardless of the methods used, they improved accuracy is likely to require additional predictors that include stronger signals of incoming cohort sizes, but these four were the most important. Now, here's what makes this interesting. Based on my career in academia, I can actually point to the size of the class, how many times the school, how many times a student's been suspended, or how much trouble they get into at school versus how much trouble they get into out of school and how often they come to class. That will tell me those predictors and I will believe this model because it meets with my own experience. That's one of the reasons why this works. I don't have a hard time having faith in this model because it matches with what I already think I know. And that's part of the thing with artificial intelligence and machine learning is that if you're coming up with something interesting, how easy is it for the person to believe in the data that you're looking at it? With this, I can believe it because I've been here. I understand how this works. I know that when I'm looking at cohorts for other colleges and other places, there was one place I actually worked at that was really interesting because we did something like a GRE, like an SAT, an ACT, um, we called it an MCQ score. And inside of that, we were looking at your language proficiency, your math, your science, and all the other things. And we were trying to figure out when you start off, if you have this MCQ score, how do you work your way through the class? How often do you actually get to the end point and what kinds of midpoint check-in grades do you get? And we found out that if you have something called an MCQ score of between 70 and, and, and 85, you will start off and you will finish the class. You will not drop out. You will finish the class and you will actually show progression of learning. You'll start off getting these scores on your first test and on your last test, you'll be pretty much so acing the whole thing. But only if you're between 70 and 85. If you're between 86 and 90, there's no noticeable discernment and in increase of performance. So even if you are top scoring in this, you're more likely to actually not show an increase in performance. You're actually more likely to drop out because you get bored. If you're below 70%, um, you're just not going to make it. You'll make it through the first test, and then you'll start feeling like, I'm not really in the right class. I shouldn't be here. So we need to pay more attention to you and bring you more into the class and help you over those hurdles. That only works between 65 and 70. Below 65, you won't survive. You won't make it through the class. So 65 to 70, I have to give extra support because we have to fill in some holes in the gaps. 70 to 85, you're perfect for my program. Um, 86 to 100. No discernible improvement, and those are highly likely you'll drop out because you get bored. And that's what our data showed us. We used this across an entire swath. We used an entire population of about 10,000 students to figure out how does that work. And it was really kind of neat. So now to save everyone time and money, 
we look for people between 70 and 85. If we have room and opening, we'll help the 65s to 70s or we'll bring in the 86s to 100s. But our sweet spot is this score. And if you're in that score, you're going to do great. And we know it. And that's why I will believe this. Because I've worked in, in academia, I understand how the data works. I understand what kind of data we collect. And I can believe this from Philadelphia. So this is what makes it neat. More than one model, definitive outcome, and some things that we can actually believe in, in terms of the most important factors. That's why this is neat. And this is why that data actually comes, comes into handy. Because now I can do intervention, right? I can keep my classes smaller. I, if you're in school and you're having struggles and you're disrupting the class and you're getting sent to the principal's office every day, I can fix that. I can actually get you into the right programs. I can get you the right support. I can get you the right people. I can get you believing in yourself. Out of school suspensions, I can't do much about, but I, maybe I can give you some after school activities to keep you out of trouble. And then absences, make sure there's a compelling reason for you to come to school every day. I can do something about each one of these. There's a problem here that can be solved. So that's why I really like what Philadelphia did on this one. And what they basically did was they did some decision making. If you can identify what your core four factors are, you can actually then start making decisions about what your process is going to look like. So we have some ideas on how to do this. We have prescriptive analytic models, identification of the problem, and environmental analysis in the model categories. And if you kind of take a look at that little graphic on the side, you'll see these categories kind of roll up into what they are. Predictive models, heuristics, simulations, optimizations via algorithm, analytic formulas. So other things that you can do, there's more than one model. There's a lot of different kinds of ways of representing the data or visualizing the data when you're going into decision-making based models. Because once you know, you can start working on these decisions, but you have to be able to believe the decision as well. So in the prescriptive analytics model, it's the process of using data to determine an optimal course of action. And that's the big one, which is going to be the right way to go. So if Philadelphia had said, oh, it's really the quality of school lunches, that's our big problem, then they would have gone in that direction, but it wouldn't have been the right one. So we want to be prescriptive about what we're doing. We're going to use an optimal course of action and we can do some extra after school activities and all these other things. So by considering all of those relevant factors, all 259 of them, there's a type of analysis that yields recommendations for next steps. So it's a really good tool for data-driven decision-making, and I have done these tools for at least the last decade of, my, of my, my role of being an instructor or being in academic administration. But they don't tell me the whole story either, right? So it's important to know algorithms can provide data-informed recommendations, but they can't replace human discernment. That's the big one. If what Philadelphia had said was school lunches rather than after-school activities, I probably wouldn't have believed it. And if I didn't believe it, then I wouldn't have believed in the model, and I would have worried about what that decision was for driving. I probably would have gone, you know, maybe we should look at something else. Or how did we weigh the data? Or what was the bias in the data? So your judgment is valuable here, and it has to provide that context and the guardrails to the, to the, uh, to the outputs. If you don't provide that human quality to it, and you just take the data as is and think it is the right solution, well, there's more there that needs to be done. And you are in this context, the guardrails. You are making sure that that makes sense, that the answer is believable, and it's something that you can actually work with. It's something that has a definitive thing that you can do for next steps, and they're relatively simple to figure out what they are. Right? You don't have to like dive super deep. You just need to figure out what that should look like and what I should look at. So investment decisions. So when we're doing this, we can actually do some really good examples here. Because if we're making investment decisions, where do we want to put our money? Do we want to put our money in our house, which is a good thing to do? Can I afford a house? How much is that mortgage going to be? What is mortgage insurance? What does taxes look like? All these things rolled up. We can take a look at our budget and kind of go with a gut feeling, but then the bank is going to take a look at what your credit score is, how much money you've got in the bank, what kind of down payment you've got, where's that down payment money coming from, because if it's coming as a gift, it's weighed differently than if it's coming out of your own pocket or if someone's just giving you the money. Well, you have to declare that. In the United States, you have to declare the taxes on that gifted money especially after a certain amount. So I think it's something like the first 10,000 is free. After that, you have to pay like a 25% windfall tax on it. So if you're going to invest in your house, there's a lot of factors that go into that. 
It's the same thing with your investing in silver and gold and the stock market, all those things. You weigh the risks and you recommend whether to invest or not. And then you recommend when you're going to pull your money out of that as well. This one, I like those sales lead scoring. So salespeople, in my experience, are pretty competitive. They like to get that deal. They like to get all the things that they're going to get, whatever it is. I'm not a salesperson, right? So what you can do to kind of help raise that idea of competition and ease of getting something out, you score the leads that your salespeople are getting based on customer factors. So in the process of assigning a point value to the various actions along the sales funnel, enabling you or an AI to rank leads based on how likely they are to convert into customers. Salespeople have traditionally go by gut instinct. They know when that deal is about to close. They know when the customer is about to make the decision. They really will drive it. Salespeople will say a lot of things to customers. They can also mark all that inside of your algorithm. What's neat is that you're basically then training your algorithm to be a super salesperson. And you can actually mark the things that they do and then rank those leads. And eventually that whole process of your super competitive salespeople and your AI really hit synergy. They really find a way of just converting customers because they know how this works. Between the AI and the human being, you end up with like a super, super salesperson. So it's neat when you do sales lead scoring because now you can find and waste, focus your time on those customers most likely to convert over and buy your product. And then content aggregation, I think we deal with this every day. If you use anything in social media now, if you use YouTube, if you use Facebook, if you use Instagram, Snapchat, te um, what Telegram, all of these things, they all will give you some kind of content curation. They're going to give you recommendations based on something that you saw before. So this is interesting because we watch Discovery Plus, the new streaming channel here in the United States, and it's actually really cool and we like it and we enjoy it. However, comma, I'm more into um, ancient aliens and my wife is more into ghost adventures. So we really confuse that recommendation engine based on who watched it last. So if, if my wife watched it last, I'll get a lot of recommendations for Ancient Alien, for um, Ghost Adventures, Ghost Brothers, that whole genre of stuff. And if I've watched it, Ancient Aliens, my wife will get a bunch of recommendations for Ancient Aliens and all the alien stuff and shockumentaries and things like that. So that's bad when we're sharing the channel. It's great if you're just kind of going along the way. Now, the thing I think is interesting, too, is YouTube's kind of added this new thing to it. And I like this. If you want to try something different. So YouTube has a big pile of data. I've been watching YouTube for over a decade. You know, most of the videos that you're seeing here are on YouTube. You can just go out to my YouTube and you can watch every class I think I've ever taught for the last decade. What's neat is that YouTube will turn around and say, hey, are you interested in this? You want to try something different? And that's a really new thing. And I think that's interesting in that content curation thing. Try something different. So I'll press the button. I'll get a bunch of new stuff up on YouTube. I'll take a look at it. I found a bunch of new music I really like. A whole new genre of music I think is really cool. So it paid off. And now I'm watching something different. And I'm actually enjoying it. And now it's become part of my thing. And now I'm just waiting for the next YouTube recommendation for something different. But once you've watched one of my videos, you'll get recommendations for more of my videos. That's what helps drive all the things that go on in terms of content creation because it works. And it's great. It's a great way of discovering stuff. So I really like content curation along the way. Bank fraud detection, I like this one as well. So there are some things that you're going to do that are normal. So like I'm traveling. I travel a lot. I go to different countries. I teach in different places. And one of the big things is bank fraud detection. So I actually have to log with the bank where I'm going to be. So it's like right now I'm getting geared up to go to the Middle East. I'm going to tell the bank that I'm going to be in this country, in this city, from this day to this day. And then I'm going to turn around because I have a two-week big vacation in there. And during that vacation, I'm going to be going to Turkey. I'm going to be going to Jordan. I'm going to be going to a couple other places because I just want to get that whole feel. So I'll tell my bank where I'm at. And that way, if if while I'm there, the bank will know, oh, Dan's in here in Saudi Arabia. Not a problem. He's doing his thing. But if all of a sudden my card gets used in South Africa to buy first class airline tickets to Italy, then the bank will know that that's a problem because I'm not really in South Africa. I'm really in Saudi Arabia. So these ways of analyzing patterns in my transactional data, I only shop at a few places in the United States. I go to the grocery store. I go to the plant store. I go to the mall. 
I go to half price books. So if I'm outside of that realm, if all of a sudden I was in, in half price books that afternoon at two o'clock and then the afternoon at four o'clock, I'm in South Africa buying tickets to Italy that shows up as bank fraud. And you can actually understand how I use my credit card because that's the only thing I use online. It's the only thing I use. We get it going. We can get that process going. The bank knows how I shop. The bank knows where I shop and they know what I shop for. Anything outside of that all of a sudden becomes flaggable. And that's actually really helpful because there's a machine in the background. The bank doesn't really pay attention to what I'm doing. The computer does. And if the computer sees something hinky in there, it will turn around and then notify a human being or notify me and then I can get connected with someone from the bank. I like that. It's really good and we've used it a couple of times. There's actually one point where my debit card got compromised and I'm sitting there. I froze my debit card the minute I saw these transactions going across because I don't want my bank account drained. And you can actually see that person pinging off. I'm on the call with the bank at that point and you can still see that person trying to use that debit card because it worked three times before I was able to get it frozen and me the bank and the computer system were all learning from this watching how that person used it and we're able to keep other people from having problems with that particular hack that was a really bad hack so good thing for bank fraud product management product managers can gather data by surveying customers so how popular is your product how is your marketing working how is your market research going who aren't current product users are you going to use that this is something we do every day product management customer surveys customer sentiment customer evaluation all of that is well-known data we've been doing this since we started making products do you want to buy this so all the data that's generated from all these ways that we do market research can be analyzed either manually or by computer. And I would rather use a computer to identify trends, discover the reasons for those trends and predict whether the trends are predicted to reoccur. Most products have what's called a hockey stick graph. So you release your product. A lot of people will buy it initially and then it will taper off into what's called the long tail. Every once in a while, though, and this is kind of interesting, because we don't really know what's going to end up happening. Something ends up being really popular. And it has a second life. So it gives a second big spike in there. goes back to long tail. So you maybe say you made dragon eggs for Game of Thrones. Right? And you had made dragon eggs your whole life. So you had a good initial spike and you were in long tail. Then your, your eggs, your dragon egg got shown as a prop on Game of Thrones. So everybody wanted it. That's going to be your second spike. So you can identify early on that if you're going to become popular, you have to ramp up your manufacturing especially if you're going to be an identifiable prop that looks cool in a popular TV series, then you know you're going to get that second spike. That's something that an AI could help you solve for and plan for. And then email automation. I'm not a big fan of email. I unsubscribe from so much stuff in email. It's not even funny anymore because marketers are used by email. I have a spam queue that on daily gets anywhere between 50 to 100 spam emails. Just don't read them, don't use them, unsubscribe, go straight to spam. So marketers are using email automation to sort leads into categories based on motivations. Um, I'm a bad, bad lead. I don't really do anything with my email. I really do just kind of trash it. So different sets of messages can trigger different things depending on where you're at. So email automation is another one of those prescriptive models. Identification of the problem and environmental analysis. One of the biggest artificial intelligence problems is data acquisition and storage. What data do we capture helps define what outputs we're going to get. If we miss some important piece of data, we miss some important stream, that won't show up in my report. It won't show up in my final analysis and may skew those results. So a well-defined problem is going to have a well-defined data set. Some of the data is going to be garbage. Some of the data is going to be noisy and we need to reduce it. A lot of it's going to be irrelevant. Right? If you're only looking at temperature and humidity in your data center, do you really need to have wind speed, sunshine hours, and all the other things that are going to come in from the weather center? Do you really need all that extra data just for temperature and humidity in a data center? Probably not. But if you want to track skin conditions at the pass, then you need to have wind speed, how much snow, how much is fresh snow, how much is the base, what's the temperature, how much of that base is frozen and refrozen and melted and refrozen. So depending on what you're doing, it depends on your data set, depends on how you need to define your problem. 
and then how well you need to define what data is going to come in to solve that problem for you. You can either have too little or too much data that will influence the problem that's identified and how it's presented. That can be interesting. Here's what makes this even more interesting. In the work environment for decision making, all of those decisions can be influenced internally to the company or internally to the family or internally to the country, city, state, wherever. All of it can be influenced by social, political, legal, physical, environmental, and other systems that people interact with. And that can also include your faith in those systems that you interact with. So we've seen um, a lot of things around public health lately. So both social, political, and legal have ended up being really interesting context around what data we believe in and what data we, we use and what data we don't use. Which has, had which has had physical economic impact in the United States. We've done some really interesting things, and now we're going through a pretty typical post-pandemic response on the economic side. So these systems that we believe with and these systems that we interact with, the data that was used to influence the decision-making for people to do a thing, take a, wear a mask, take a shot, take an extra booster, whatever, all were influenced by the data that was generated on what we think we believe in or how we believe in and the people that we choose to believe in. And believe me, these are an environmental analysis. So inside the company, if the company doesn't believe a certain thing is going to work and all the data indicates that, no, you really need to go do this, the company probably won't do it, even if the data says to do a thing. If you're working in society and you're working in a group of people and you say, hey, this after school activity like the one city of Philadelphia will work. It will help keep people off the streets. Basketball, sports always works. Boy, girl sports always works, believe it or not, because it gives someone a way to burn off energy. It gives them a way to build teamwork and camaraderie. But if you don't have anyone that can fund it and you don't have anyone believe that after school sports will work, you'll never do it and you'll never know. So making sure that you are covered and understand those social, political, legal, and physical and economic systems is important. If Philadelphia had come up with just about any other answer, I probably wouldn't have believed it. I probably wouldn't have believed that model. I probably wouldn't have gone along with whatever the city of Philadelphia wanted to do. So all of these things have a big play in it. And our belief in what that output is and the accuracy of what that output is matters. All systems predict differently across cultures to adopt those cultural norms. So an AI system in India works differently and gives a different answer when it's programmed by Indian programmers versus the system that was built in America or in China or in Russia will all give you different answers because they're all built around specific cultural norms, especially if they're purely built by that group of people with no influence from an outside cultural group. So we can take a big one on this one. We can take a look at biometrics. Biometrics in China have a really easy time with Chinese faces. They have a really hard time with Korean and Japanese faces, which I think is interesting. In America, facial recognition works really, really good with white people, but not so good on American Asians or, American, or African Americans. All right. And India, pretty much the same thing. You'll find that different variations across different caste systems work better than others. That is a really good way of taking a look at those cultural norms. And as long as you get more and more complexity, AI systems will predict differently. Facial recognition will work differently. Systems work differently based on those cultural norms. Something to be really, really aware of when you're doing identification of the problem and environmental analysis. Just because it works in one country and one group of people does not mean it will work in others. The city of Philadelphia may have unique problems that will not fit the same group in the city of Seattle. Again, the city of Seattle would have to run its own analysis and see if they match up on what the city of Philadelphia did. So there's some model categories I do want you to know about, and one of those are domain expert, domain extension, and then complex planner. So I like the domain expert. Um, we're all domain experts in some form or another. There's always something that we're experts in, right? So problems which involve reasoning based on complex body of knowledge. This includes tasks based on like legal, finance, accounting, formulating a process. 
So machines can actually really simulate this expert in the field. We've been building expert systems for a long time now. So we really do understand how this works. We already have expert systems in law. It's really interesting in China, there's actually a legal AI that if you can't afford a lawyer or you just don't want to pay for a lawyer, this legal AI can actually plead your case for you. You just say what you need to do, where you want to go, what's your expected outcome and in court system, and it will be legally binding as kind of an arbitration, small court kind of thing. There's an expert system that will do this for you in China. In America, we are just now building out those domain expert systems so that if you type in what kind of case you're doing, say you're doing a product damage case, it can show you all the different kinds of cases around that. So you don't have to know the law. You just have to know enough about the law to be able to find all of the things that apply to your specific case. Then turn those over to a lawyer who really does know how to plead their case. All right. Domain extension. I like this one because it really involves extending a complex body of knowledge. And again, this is where uh, my nephew is working in AI right now. Um, he works at Peptide Research, again, which we've talked about. So he's busy extending the domain of understanding about how peptides work. So he's looking for new drugs, cure diseases, make new forms of whatever peptides do, because I'm not a biologist. I don't know, but he's doing neat things. Right. So that information that he's gathering about how peptides work, how they chemically bond, how they fold, all of that will go into a big database and then use to find new drugs, cure diseases, do new products, anything along the way. So he'll get a bunch of new insights into the domain himself, even though he may not use it. He's working as part of a consortium of companies that are interested in this. So it's neat. And then complex planner, again, logistics and scheduling tasks. These are all done things we do now by non AI, but you can really optimize your organization by having an AI help schedule complex tasks, making sure that your fruit arrives fresh and ready to go from wherever it is grown to markets in your country. That's a pretty normal one. Um, if you've got a hitch, if something's going on at the port, if something's going on with a trucking company, AI can help find different alternate resources, maybe a different port, help solve problems. AIs are pretty good with this one. So as long as you have a complex data set and humans can't detect a pattern, but a machine can do this easily, like maybe that ship has got a history of breaking down or getting stranded or something else, and your products on that ship, uh, your AI can help you find out if that ship's actually going to really make it or not. Better communicator. So these are tasks which involve existing communication. AI and deep learning can help communication modes such as automatic translation, intelligent agents. And I like this one because I use Google Translate. Again, I do tend to travel and go teach in interesting new places. And I don't always understand the language initially. I'll usually get dropped off. So I will spend probably my first month in a country with Google Translate. It works. By then, I'm starting to pick up about 100 words of whatever language I'm, I'm supposed to learn and be able to start navigating and rely less on Google Translate. But I love that automatic translation of Google Translate because the guy can, or the shopkeeper or the taxi driver or the hotel or wherever can help me get to where I need to go because I can show them in their native language where I want to go just because I have that translate. And it works really, really well. I like new perception tests which involve perception, enabling newer forms of perception, which enables new services such as autonomous vehicles. So Waymo and Tesla and Uber and others that are working in, in the self-driving car, that's a big one. And there's been a lot of things learned about how smart cars and smart roads and smart devices intersect and interact with each other. So that perception, that ability of taking an environment and bringing it down to a computer model so that a computer can actually interact with that has come a long way from when we started in the 1970s at MIT 50 years ago to where we are now, to where your Tesla, you can just press a button and your Tesla can come to you. It will drive itself to you wherever your beeper is. So that's kind of neat. Enterprise AI. So AI meets re-engineering the corporation. So when you get a lot of media attention about a lot of things, and one of the ones you don't is how do you create new insights from automatic feature detection via deep learning? So in turn, help customize or change or improve business processes. So every business process that we've got is basically a workflow. We go from raw product through all of our suppliers, through our manufacturing process, to our another shipping and delivery product 
to their customer. There is always a way to make things more optimally performed, do things better. And I think we're going to see a big change in this post COVID because of the way we weren't able to get product to people in such a way. We found that the just in time supply chain on a global scale couldn't handle pandemic processes. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see that consolidation of manufacturing back into the state, into the states or into the countries. So you're seeing now Intel actually taking an interest in Ohio. They're going to build a $15 billion chip manufacturing plant in Ohio. You're seeing a lot of other things come about that will bring manufacturing back in a limited quantity for things that are truly in storage supply. I don't think you're going to see a big difference in terms of where they make paper products like paper towels, but I think you're going to see critical systems come back to a country of origin. So India will start making its own chips. China will continue to make its own chips, but will have less outflow. They'll only be using them more and more internally. America will get back in chip making. Israel will probably get bigger chip factories. So again, it's that whole idea, that ability to re-engineer and AI is going to help coordinate a lot of that. So enterprise AI will use unstructured and cognitive capabilities and data warehousing, all the data that a company makes to help re-engineer that business process, that business workflow. It's kind of a neat process on that one. All right, problems which impact domains due to second order consequences of AI. Now, this one's kind of interesting because this is one of the ones that's a part of the Burlman Trust Index. And a lot of people are really worried about um, what's going to happen in the future. What jobs get automated out? What, uh, what jobs don't get automated out? Where do they go? What do we do with people? So in the near future, we could benefit from improved algorithms but there's going to be a human consequence to those. So example, speech recognition improvements continue to be made, I may not need as many physical translators at the United Nations. If I can go ahead and automate all of that dialogue back and forth at the United Nations and get a really good AI that will do automatic translations on the fly and be 100% accurate like a human being, pay, pay better attention than a human being, um, that will work. But it will mean I need less people that know how to speak the language. So I may need less translators. So there's a human consequence to that. If I go traveling, um, I don't know Arabic. I don't know Turkish. I don't know Hebrew. But I'm going to go with my Google AI. And I'll be able to, to navigate. So three people won't get a job translating for me. So again, it's kind of that evolution of expert systems, implementation of AI deep learning in the near future. Uh, lots of changes are coming, especially about how we take a look at business workflows, how we look at impact on individual ind corporations like translation services and others. Big difference. So super long sequence pattern recognition. I like this one. And this is uh, sequential pattern recognition. It's still early stage and have yet to get a lot of attention. But what's neat, though, if you take a look at sequential pattern recognition, that's a big one. It comes with cars. It comes with surgeries, comes with driving, comes with flight comes with all those other things because you're constantly changing things and you're working on the process and then extending sentiment analysis using AI. I really like sentiment analysis because it really helps me understand where people are coming from and where they're going and in ways that um, they're not going to tell me. They'll tell rate my professor, they'll tell Glassdoor, they'll write it up in a blog entry, they'll put it up on Facebook. And you know, being able to extend that sentiment analysis by bringing in multiple channels, whether social media, private, public information, you know, as long as you can get to it, you can pull up a sentiment analysis depending on which company you're working for and how much they want to spend on doing that. So really just neat different ways of going about process on this one. So structure of mathematical models for decision support. So math helps us define what something should look like. It helps us define where, how we want to transform data into a visualization. If you're working on your PhD, you're going to have variables. You're going to have decision variables, places you make a decision, and the mathematical relationship between the data you're looking at and the output you're going to be doing in chapter four and chapter five. Those result variables. You're going to have a bunch of stuff in there. So when you're building out your PhD and you're building out what you want to research, you're basically doing the same thing. You're doing a mathematical model. You're doing qualitative or quantitative. You're debating how you want to do your process, chi-square, regression, you know, however you want to do your math and all those other things. This is no different. 
it just looks a whole lot bigger because you're working with larger data sets. So when I did my PhD, I worked with the Lumen database. The Lumen database is a database of all of the DMCA notices that have been collected via Microsoft, Amazon, YouTube, and others. And we basically did a huge data regression on that entire database to kind of see where we were as a snapshot state when I did my PhD. So we actually had math because someone actually already did this in 1997. So we used their math, we used their methodology, and we basically extended out their research to see if anything had changed from 1997 to 2012 to 2017. So I had two other markers. It's the same kind of concept, that components of the mathematical models, variables, decision parameters, constants, calibration parameters, and I had my calibration points. I had two previous surveys for mine. So it all worked, right? We were able to get a pretty good output. We were able to take a look at that quantitative model and how that model worked over to a qualitative model for what my output actually looked like and we're able to validate the data from previous but also see the drift in the data and that has been that that whole process had become even more interesting and more broken over time so we also have to deal with certainty uncertainty and risk the risk is an interesting subject Four major types of uncertainties in decision-making problems. Data uncertainty, prediction uncertainty, judgment uncertainty, and action uncertainty. Uh, we're not going to be sure about anything we're doing here. We're going to hope that we got our model right. We're going to try to do as much stuff as we can do to prove that we got our model right. But there's always going to be that nagging doubt. Unless you have complete faith in that model, like I do with Philadelphia, because I can understand those four things and I have a solution for those four things. And I trust their data. And I trust that they did a bunch of other stuff to make sure it was good to go. Making decisions under uncertainty is easy, but under uncertainty it is not because it is a risk. And sometimes risk in companies are bad. It depends on your company, how your company deals with the risk, what their risk acceptance are. There are some companies that just absolutely cannot tolerate risk. They need to work in certainty. They need to work in a certain market doing a certain thing at a certain time. They're not good candidates for building a lot of expert systems that are going to help them make risky decisions because their company simply can't tolerate risk culturally. There are other companies like some banks, some investment terms, hedge funds and others that absolutely adore risk. The bigger the risk, the bigger the payoff. And they'll dive into some of the most risky, crazy stuff you've ever seen anybody do and maybe bring the whole company down. Like when you... <clears throat> go ahead and you try to go against a bunch of institutional investors versus people investors. So things like GameStop, if anyone ever followed that, the conditions for short selling GameStop were there. GameStop was a company and still is a company that's going out of business. Their just business model is not working post COVID protocols. People are downloading games. They're not selling games anymore. The whole nature of gaming industry on the back end is changing. So a bunch of hedge funds said, hey, we're going to short sell because it's only going to go down. The business model indicates, the data indicates, the prediction is that it's going to go down. The judgment is that, yeah, it's going to happen. And the action was short sell every single hand of stock they could get for GameStop. And walks Reddit says, oh, no, we like GameStop. So they started buying it. So all the people that short sold all of a sudden had to come up with that difference between the short sell and then the going price. And you have a lot of people flooding in to buy GameStop stock to prop it up. Actually cost a hedge fund. Hedge fund actually went out of business. They were so leveraged into GameStop stock, stock trying to sell short because all the data set and the risk tolerance was huge that they weren't able to unwind their position fast enough on the onslaught of hundreds of Reddit people going in there and hold and buying the stock. So making decisions under certainty is easy. GameStop is going to go down in stock price. The data, the AI, all the modeling indicates it will. But then we had an uncontrolled variable come in. We had Reddit come in. And making uh, not being able to move fast enough to unwind cost a company its entire thing. Now, if that hadn't happened, GameStop short selling make a lot of money, everyone would have been happy. GameStop still would have gone out of business. GameStop is still going to go out of business. But made a big risk. Model set X. Model had an unpredictable variable step in called Reddit. You never know. 
you may be making the best decision in the world and some unpredictable model is going to come in there. Um, war, disease, movement of population, all of a sudden your product becomes obsolete because of some technological change. You don't know. You have to make best guess. And that can be really kind of scary. Now we'll do this all the time in spreadsheets. If you've ever done um, any kind of tabling, if you've ever done any kind of what if scenarios in Excel or any other kind of spreadsheet, we're really used to this. So doing those modeling and spreadsheets, it's the same thing when you're doing it in a data warehouse. You just have a larger data set. So we're used to some of this already. We already do some of this already. It's pretty comfortable, but now we just need to bring the able to move to a larger data set and kind of work with that larger data set as we go through. And then mathematical programming, if you're used to working in Excel, you understand the formulas, count if, sum, average, mean, median, all that kind of, kind of good stuff. You can do those same kind of things inside of your programming. And again, it's pretty just so much programming. How much of this product did you sell? What color was it? All the rest of it. You can use a whole family of tools to solve managerial problems. They're all available and they're all drag and drop now. So while you were in chapter five, you were learning a lot of math. Right now, all those ma mathematical models are drag and drop. You can actually do those in things like Tableau. You really are only picking the data and you can run it however you want to run it. It's going to be really rare that you're going to be running some kind of oddball report. You still need to know how to program for it, but it's a really linear process. You're going to take X amount of this column because this tells me how much a product I sold to this zip code, to this income base if I can get it, to this sentiment on Facebook, to the sentiment on Yelp because the two are different. Facebook is more natural where Yelp is people are really super happy or super angry about my product. So you can do all these things. You just have to figure out how you want to drag and drop all these files back together. And then what do you want as your output? What do you want as your outcome? Now you can have multiple goals. You can also do what's called a sensitivity analysis and what if and goal seeking. So really standard to what we do in Excel right now, just with a bigger data set. Uh, what if analysis structured? What will happen if I do this? What will happen if I give a new color? What will happen if I do this new port of whatever I want to add to my product? However it works. Um, sensitivity analysis is important for prescriptive analytics because it allows flexibility and adaptation to changing conditions and requirements. So 2019, pre-COVID, world's going on. We needed sensitivity analysis to indicate how shipping and shutting down factories and home isolation would absolutely affect markets. Now, the good part is that did anyone ever see Uber Eats or DoorDash really grew because of that? And restaurants were able to stay open if they were able to move from an in-person dining model to a delivery model could absorb the cost of DoorDash and Uber Eats and others imposed on that company because it can be as much as 35% of that total bill comes out of the restaurant's cost. So $10 sandwich, you're still having, you have to give DoorDash $3.34 of that or more to make it work. So how much do you raise prices by? Again, it's that whole what if. Well, how much can I change my price by? You could be sitting there what if scenario and with DoorDash knowing what your final costs are going to be and working out what will happen if I change this because I need to incorporate DoorDash. Maybe I need to raise my prices by 35%. And you saw a lot of restaurants doing that. There's a huge difference now. Restaurants have gotten crazy expensive because you have to have in-person costs the same as your DoorDash costs. You can't just raise prices because of DoorDash if you look at their terms of service. So your restaurant now needs to raise its cost by 35% to cover the DoorDash. So people that are inside the restaurant actually are paying a 35% premium so that DoorDash and in-person restaurant experience prices match. And that's where you got a lot of this price raging, but it helped companies stay afloat. Your goal seeking was to stay afloat. These are the things you're going to do. You don't really necessarily need an AI for that, but you could use one and you could figure out if all of the other restaurants in the area are doing the same thing and they were to stay alive during this process. Decision analysis with decision tables and decision trees. So decision tables conveniently organize information systematic tabular manner. Decision trees are more interesting because they'll show the relationships of the problem graphically. So a decision tree is a lot like an org chart. A decision table is just basically a big spreadsheet. And you can handle 
different kinds of different processes with these. And again, data shape matters on this one, data, how that data works. If you want to do sentiment analysis, if you want to do any kind of relationship analysis, social graph, you're going to use a decision tree. If you just want to rush numbers, grind numbers, grind your web logs, you'll just use a big table. So format matters. It just makes it easier now because there's some differences, right? Table or tree. Both decision tables and trees evaluate properties and conditions. They'll return results. You can use whatever format you need to know, but a decision table, the values in the column evaluate the same property or pair. So I can have product, how much sold, product, how much sold, product, how much sold. I can break it out by day. I can break it out by region. I can break it out by zip code, all those things. Decision tree is more interesting, in my opinion, because I can get relationships. Well, if zip code A is more interested in the orange and zip code B, which is right next door, is more interested in red, is there a way for me to get and smooth this out so zip code A and B are equally interested in orange and red? What is it about zip code A that's interested in orange and zip code B that's interested in color red? What makes them special? What is the relationship between all those things? Is it income? Is it... Uh, some kind of geographical feature, is it some kind of um, anything else that would go into that. So those relationships between those things are neat. You can evaluate all of those relationships, all those branches that evaluate to perform an action. You can also use that in processing and manufacturing. Your decision tree for processing and manufacturing is huge, but any kind of business workflow makes for a great tree because you're going to have different decisions that get to be made at different times based on different processes in the manufacturing process. Sometimes they change. Decision trees, there's no difference in performance. Um, they all work the same now. There's mathematical formulations for things like Merkle trees and other kinds of trees that go along with it. So there's no performance difference. Decision tables cannot always be used interchangeability though with something like Pega platform applications. You can reference a decision table or decision tree on rules, expressions, activities, routes, so all that maintains the same. You can have your authority matrix. In other words, there's really no difference between the two. They perform the same. They work the same. They do the same. It just all depends on what kind of data you're working at. Is it better tabular? Is it looking at a web log? Is it looking at finances? Is it looking at orders or product? Then it's going to be better off as a table. If you're looking at a flow, a workflow, a decision process, an organization chart, and how those things work, your social graph is always going to work better as a tree. Now, simulation is interesting. These can be your what if, right? These can be things like what happens if I change this color? Or what happens if I change this price is another one. That's a really big one. Pricing is made off of simulations. How many people need the product? How many people need the product for what? You see this in medical a lot. Um, you're coming out with a new product that will save lives. How many people need it? If the markets aren't really that big. You, you want to recoup or you want to get all the market can bear. So you're going to go to a simulation and figure out what you can price that new drug at. And that's exactly how pricing model works in, in, in medical. You're going to simulate your way into what's the point where I can sell the most product at what price point. So major characteristics, advantages, and disadvantages of that simulation, basically major characteristics are an adequate model of complex real world situation where the student interacts. So that student or that person, each defined role of the participant with responsibilities and constraints, data rich environment, and then feedback for participants actions. So let's go back to my medical model. So the real world situation is I have diabetes. Okay, there you go. I have a diagnosis for diabetes. Each participant needs to take an X amount of insulin every month or every day or every week to survive. The data-rich environment, hey, I know insulin sales because we track all that stuff. It's reportable to the FDA. It's reportable to a bunch of the other medical groups. We can pretty much so track diabetes because it's, it's a condition. It's a thing, right? And it's going to be tracked. It's going to be tracked by the United States government, and all the data is going to be pretty clean. So we have a really data-rich environment. So we can range strategies based on decision making by how many people have diabetes, what the average cost of insulin is, who's got it more where. How much supply of this stuff do I need to have? You can also mark it down by, is there a natural disaster? So say you had a hurricane come rolling through Florida, you need to get a whole bunch of new product to Florida because insulin needs to be refrigerated. And what's the first thing that goes out in a hurricane? Power. So all that insulin that was refrigerated, unless there was on a generator, uh, didn't get compromised somehow, 
you need to go get new product in there. And that's what we're talking about, that data-rich environment. You can really make a good range of strategies to the decision-making. You can actually pre-plan diabetes medicines and other medicines to a hurricane zone because you pretty much know the track of the hurricane that's coming through or the track of the cyclone. Um, the emergency management system will pre-stage trucks with blankets and water and tents and other things outside of that hurricane zone so they can be the first ones in to the hurricane zone with food, water, shelter, and all the things that these people are going to need, and also medicines. Now, you can get feedback for participants' actions in the form of changes to the problem. So if I have my diabetes medicine prices can raise and lower. And you can actually track how that raise and lower goes. So there's a program in the United States called GoodRx. That'll help you find the lowest price for, diet for insulin. And you can use this and you can go to the right store and get the lowest price. You can track how GoodRx works against sales, against all the other things that go along with that. So you can get some really good feedback from participants just by their shopping habits. You don't need to talk to them or nothing. Now, your doctors, you can go back and you can track them and go, what are your diabetes patients saying and all the rest of it. So you can get some really good changes in the problem situation and in the simulation to figure out how that's going to work. And each one of these things have got their own steps and their own processes, but the data is there. And you can make some really interesting decisions based on that data about where's the pain point? What can I get out of it? How much should I charge? Now, there are people from an ethical, legal, social, or political viewpoint that will say this is a thing or this is an issue, but the reality is this is how medicine in America works right now. Doesn't mean it's a good thing, doesn't mean it's a bad thing, it just means this is how it works. So the simulation allows you to explore what if questions, scenarios without having to experiment on the system itself. And that's the cool part, you can identify bottlenecks, you can do information and product flows, gain insight into which variables are the most important to system performance, that includes the entire production and workflow, or that includes the workflow in an office. That includes the interactions between people. The main disadvantage of simulations is they aren't the real thing. So people can react differently when faced with situations in the real world. Some people will panic, some people will jump in and it'll become a hero. People will do things differently. You can end up with some really interesting situations based on some hidden quality in terms of how people react to stress or how people react to um, dangerous environments or how they react to negative events or how they react to positive events. Right? You may have someone that just did 10 years at the company you buy them a cake and they can't believe that you bought them a cake, right? Because that's like totally cool that you brought in cake for this 10-year employee. That's pretty neat. Or birthdays or things like that. We get used to doing things and the simulation may say, hey, this person wanted to have a birthday. Their birthday is this day. Let's have a big birthday party for them. And they may become embarrassed. The simulation said birthday parties are great. The bad part is the person is probably turning 50 and you didn't want to really buy a bunch of black balloons and celebrate their birthday that way. People do things differently. Again, so the disadvantage of the simulation is basically it's not the real world. Now, there's some advantages, though. It can be safer and cheaper than the real world, right? You don't want to go out there and try to do crazy stuff and see what happens. And simulations are really good when it comes to things like medicines, protein folding, um, chemical bonding and interactions. You can actually simulate the whole thing. We simulate a lot of what we used to do with animal testing. There are whole simulations now that will mimic the entire biochemistry of a rabbit or of a human being to see how that drug will interact. That is way safer, safer working in a simulated human being or working in a simulated rabbit than working on real rabbits or real people. You're able to test a product or system way before building it. That's the great part about it, right? You can use and find unexpected problems. What looked really good, what worked in mice and what worked in rabbits suddenly became toxic in humans. Why? What was it about the mouse genome or the rabbit genome that was able to process that new chemical or that new thing and showed really good therapeutic effect, but in a human becomes hugely problematic. You can find some really interesting unexpected problems. Now you've got to remanufacture that molecule or that chemical or that drug so that it's not toxic to humans and still maintain the non-toxicity to rabbits and to mice. So what is it about the shape or the complexity of that molecule, right? You're able to explore what if questions, what happens if I fold it this way, what happens if I put this in there for that chemical bond, what happens if I do all these other things along the way to make it less toxic to humans and still maintain its non-toxicity to rabbits and to mice. You can speed up things. You can actually run simulations short, a long time. You can do a lot of things. You can actually speed up time. 
So you can actually crash a whole year's worth of, of simulation time into a day. Figure out how these things work. That is a huge advantage. You're not just waiting for time to happen. You can just go ahead and make it happen because you're working in a simulated environment. Now, the disadvantages, of course, mistakes can be made. <laughs> you know, that's an everyday thing, right? Programming, rules, anything that's in the simulation or in the model, mistakes can be made. Bias can be incorporated, right? Data can be fudged. Th things can be done intentionally or unintentionally to make the model work. The cost of the simulation model can be high, especially if it's super complex. If you need a supercomputing um, aspect to it, if you're going to model hurricanes or you're going to be modeling complex systems like weather, that can be, become really expensive really fast. The cost of running several different simulations can be high. It depends on where you're going at. Most people are going to be running these simulations in the cloud, so at least you have that to your advantage. But it still can be pretty high. It still can be pretty pricey doing a lot of these things in the cloud. Some of the cloud systems that you might need to buy for a simulation can run as much as $4,000 an hour to burn. So depending on your company, that may not be a whole lot of money. If you're a PhD student, that is a ton of money. $4,000 an hour is a lot of money. The time needed to make sense of the results may exceed what you're willing to put up with, or it just may not give you the results that you need to have. And then people's reaction to the model of simulation may not be realistic or reliable. And that's another big one, right? It depends on what the social, political, economic, and legal ramifications around that model are. And you can't always predict people. You can statistically apply crowd theory. You can do that if you're working in a large enough crowd. But it's really hard to predict one person. It's really hard to predict one molecule. It's really easy to predict a lump of silver, a lump of gold. But it's really hard to predict how a molecule of silver or gold are going to work with each other. It's the same kind of concept. The smaller you get, the smaller the sample, the harder it is to be realistic or reliable. And then we have to be able to see it. We have to be able to visual visualize that interactive simulation. We have to be able to work with it. So how we interact with that model, how it's doing, and how the visualizations are presented really makes a big difference in what we believe in. So you're going to see things like Lucidchart and others that will give you some really good visualizations on this. And there's some simulation software that will give you really good visualizations like on this decision tree that you're seeing here on the screen. But how we visualize that, that mathematics around visualization, how we present it, whether it's pie chart, bar chart, uh, word cloud, sentiment analysis of some sort, uh, workflow, organization chart, decision tree, however we do this is going to help define whether our data is reliable or believable. And it's going to be on people's belief. It's not going to be because they don't want to believe it's because they need to be able to see it and be able to in, in, you know, almost intuitively grasp what you're trying to say and make it work for them. They need to be able to understand that relationship and that's where visualization comes in place. A bad visualization can otherwise destroy perfectly good data. So visual interactive simulations are the development of applications and simulations which produce that dynamic display of system model flow. So these are really kind of neat and these are pretty standard now, but you need to make sure that your use of visual interactive simulations or otherwise can actually work and people can understand it. You'll need a good UI UX people. You'll need to be able to have someone that can build this model out for you and understand what it should look like and why it should look the way it looks. And that's where you get into your data analysis person, right? Your all team is going to be working on making that visualization a dashboard dashboard heads up display whatever you're getting tons of data in now you just need to make it and reduce it down to the point where I can make a decision off of it and that can be difficult and that can be complex and that can be really hard and these simulation the visual interactive simulation can really help you there okay that's it that's it for chapter eight and I really want to thank you for being in this lecture I know it's kind of long and I will see you in the next one